so much. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, Marilyn, Eric, everyone from the Linda Hall Library. Thank you for the arrangements that you've made so that I could speak here. It really is truly an honor to be in this special, special place. And thank you to all three of the alumni associations for your work in putting this together and making it possible for me to be here. I'm going to talk about biomedical engineering and my view of some fraction of medicines of the future. And I want to start first by acknowledging that this is uh, certainly not work that I did alone, but it's work that I did in uh, collaboration with colleagues. And, and some of them are listed here, mainly physician scientists who I've been privileged to work with at Yale. And the work is really empowered by the participation of students and postdocs and uh, students at all levels. And so I'm going to try to point out their, um, their uh, uh, contributions as I go along. It's always useful to have a map, so I thought I would give you at least a brief outline of what I, I hope to say uh, today. Um, I want to uh, start with a, a little introduction of myself, and I'm always embarrassed after such a generous introduction as the one uh, Lisa gave me. I think I sometimes a little embarrassed to go on, but I'm going to tell you a little bit more about myself that's not in my CV. <laughs> And then I'm going to talk about an overview of some of the ways that engineers have impacted medicine um, and modern medicine. And these are things that you know, just to remind you about how there's really engineering accomplishment behind these remarkable uh, elements of progress. And then I'll say a little bit about some components that I think are going to be important in the future. And those two areas where I think they'll impact, one is gene editing to cure genetic diseases, and the other to improve vaccination. So introductory remarks. So I, I give talks like this frequently, mostly on the, uh, on the East Coast. And so I start with this, uh, the 48 contiguous states of the United States. And I say, is anyone here from Iowa? <laughs> and, and I usually find no one. Um, but if I say it here, is anyone here from Iowa? <laughs> the light is bright, but I got a, I got a few. So, when, when, when there's no answer, I say, well, do you know where Iowa is? <laughs> and, you know, I'll get some of these, and I'll get some of these, but you know, you know that that's where it is. And this is Des Moines, Iowa, where I uh, mainly grew up. And um, this is my grandfather, Woody, who, uh, who uh, lived in Iowa all his uh, life. And, and Woody uh, was a farmer, uh, my paternal grandfather. He was a farmer, and um, he, his farm, uh, oops, I missed it. Uh oh, his farm is here. Uh, a picture of uh, at least uh, some part of his farm, and my brother and sister and I own 40 acres of it uh, still. That was in southern Iowa, right on the Missouri border, Ringgold County, Iowa. Um, and uh, I'm telling you this story partly to introduce you to my grandfather and my grandmother Carmen. That's me uh, when I was very young. But, but I tell you the story partly to enhance my credibility to this crowd, because I know where I am. And I always feel more comfortable on this central time. Uh, so it's, it's lovely to, to be here. Um, but my grandparents, Carmen and Woody, did one remarkable thing for me. They, they gave me my grandmother's car in 1981 so that I could drive to Cambridge, Massachusetts and enroll in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology for graduate school. And that experience, their, their willingness to make that experience possible for me uh, really changed my life. And it was there I learned about the things that I'm going to uh, tell you about today at, where I started this kind of uh, work. And since that time, I've been uh, teaching and doing research at uh, institutions along the uh, East Coast, uh, but ended up at Yale 20 years ago and delighted to be there. And as Lisa mentioned, I was the head of Jonathan Edwards College. That's Jonathan Edwards College in the spring, a beautiful place. And that's my daughter, Willa, who's four years old, standing behind the, standing behind the tulips. So one more story. And uh, this also involves one of my family members, my mother. That's her holding me. And there we are in the car where she's allowing me to explore an early curiosity in plastics, <laughs> which, uh, I, which I've, you'll see I, I have extended throughout my life. But the other thing that my mother did for me was my sister, who's nearly the same age and I, she would take us to the library constantly. And she introduced us to reading. She was a kindergarten teacher, a first grade teacher, and introduced us to reading and a love of books. And uh, we went to the West Des Moines Library, which I don't have a photo of from the time, but this was from their website. Uh, I, 
in my mind, the, the, the stacks were higher, but, um, <laughs> but what, a, what a wonderful thing for a mother to do to uh, allow their child not only to understand how important books are, but to immerse them in that environment. Uh, and um, the first real research library I learned about was the Hayden Library at MIT, it's shown here. There is, uh, this, these windows face the Charles River, and there used to be a very comfortable chair right there that I would, I would get a volume of books or two volumes of books, volumes of journal articles mainly, and take them to this chair and have the most peaceful sleep I'd ever known, <laughs> and then wake up and be able to read. And it was just a, a marvelous experience. So I wanna really congratulate you for what you do here in uh, this unique kind of resource a resource for people, making it available uh, to the public. And I know the work you do is not easy, and times are changing, and there's all different sorts of media, but your affection for and attention to books, I really admire. These are my daughters at the Mitchell Library near our home in, uh, in New Haven. They love books, and I'm hoping to carry it forward to the next generation with them as well. So let me give you some, an overview of some of the ways that you already know about that engineers have impacted modern medicine. And uh, the, the theme is that many of the products that make uh, the innovations that make modern healthcare effective arose from collaborations between physicians and engineers. A good example of that is dialysis. This is a dialysis unit from a kidney dialysis machine. If you looked inside this casing, you'd find uh, tens of thousands of hollow fibers. Blood flows through those hollow fibers and uh, waste products are excreted out to the outside and they're removed. And this has been a life-saving invention for, uh, for um, many, many millions of people with end-stage renal disease. And it's a medical device that has a specially designed material. In this case, it's a hollow fiber that gives its most part important function. This is a drug-eluting stent. And stents are devices, they're kind of like cages that get get um, inserted into the vascular system. Uh, a, a cardiologist will do this, usually through the, a, a large artery in the leg. They'll put a catheter in, and they'll move this device up into the heart where you have a clogged artery, and the stent will hold that clogged artery open. And drug-eluting stents provide an additional release of drugs slowly at that site to prevent uh, an unwanted uh, side effect of uh, having a stent called restenosis uh, and make these even a more remarkable development. And when this was introduced, when this kind of concept was introduced early in the 2000s, it became the biggest selling uh, drug product in the history of, of pharmaceuticals because of the importance of the problem it was solving. And it's a medical device with a special material that performs its most important function. And this is an example of an of a artificial hip. There's two pieces. There's one that goes into the femur with a ball up here, made of metal usually. There's a second piece made of metal and a polymer in between those two so that the hip can rotate on the fixed cup of the uh, femur. And my father had a hip uh, replacement uh, 10 years or so ago, and he was in and out of the operating room in 90 minutes. And uh, his life changed. He, he was remarkably uh, mobile after that with very little uh, side effects. And so these are devices uh, that have improved people's lives and they're the result of collaborations between many, many engineers and many, many physicians. One more example that I like uh, is the contact lens. And uh, this, uh, this uh, diagram here shows you a picture from an early patent. There's probably a copy of this patent in this building somewhere <laughs> from 1939. And you can see the, 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 the sort of outlines of the contact lenses we know now, the shape. And there's a, there's a glass for focusing. And there's a bonding layer of wax, which is important for holding it to your eye. This one did not take off. <laughs> probably because of the materials were not exactly right for the application. But the work of engineers and chemists uh, with guidance from physicians took uh, what you learned in organic chemistry and turned it into materials that you can put into contact with one of the most sensitive tissues in your body. And you can leave it there for hours or days or long periods sometimes, depending on the design. And um, it remarkable. Uh, achievement and a remarkable, remarkable contribution to, uh, to people. Over 30 million individuals in the U.S. wear contact lenses. And I'm sure there's a lot of them in this, in this room. So one kind of material that we've been especially interested in is a special uh, class of polymers or plastics that slowly degrade in water. 
<coughs> excuse me, allergies. You have allergens in Kansas City. <laughs> so <clears throat> this is a polymer called polylactide co-glycolide. Two monomers that are, <clears throat> that are um, covalently bonded together. But if you make a long chain of these polymers, you make it into a solid material. And if you put it in water, this material slowly dissolves because these bonds, these polyester bonds here, are susceptible to hydrolysis just in the presence of water. So as a result, you can take this material, you can use engineering methods to fashion it into a device like a fiber, and you can use that fiber as a suture. And that suture used by a surgeon could, could, uh, could uh, be used to bring edges of a wound together, the wound will heal, the suture will dissolve, nothing else needs to happen. Right? So that's a very interesting kind of material. And uh, engineers have learned how to make all kinds of different devices out of polymers or plastics like this. This is a bone screw made of polylactic acid. It's a solid screw. You can screw it into a bone. That's how strong it is. Uh, but it will completely dissolve over some period of months, holds the bone together, healing occurs, the material disappears. So that's sort of the jumping off place for where I wanted to start talking about the work that, that we've done. And um, one of the things that we learned to do about 20 years ago was to take that same material, polylactide co-glycolide or PLGA, and to make it into nanoparticles. And this, um, this, this scanning electron micrograph shows you a picture of a field of nanoparticles. And two microns is a scale bar down here. You probably can't appreciate how small these are. If I had them in, in, suspended in water, you wouldn't be able to see it. The water would look clear. They're too small to diffract light, so you can't see them. They're um, about 100 nanometers in diameter, and that's the size of a virus. So a virus like uh, HIV, like the coronavirus, influenza virus, they're objects that are about 100 nanometers in diameter. So that's how small these particles are. But we learned how to load them with drugs. So now you have a plastic particle, very tiny, the small size of a virus, but loaded with drugs. And those have interesting properties. One is that the particles are made of a material that's been used in medicine for uh, 40, 50 years. And so they're not toxic to cells. But if you load them with drugs, like chemotherapy drugs, they slowly release the drugs from the, uh, from the tiny particles. If you uh, give them to cells in culture, they will kill the cells. And the dose response curve suggests that they're more potent when you put them in a nanoparticle than they are when they're not put in a nanoparticle. And as a result, you can inject them into tumors in animals. And in some cases, the tumors just simply stop growing. And these uh, features appear to be related to several uh, observations that you could make from this uh, confocal microscope of a cancer cell. This is a cancer cell. Red is the outline of the cell. Blue is the nucleus of the cell. That's where the DNA is. And the green are nanoparticles. And if you watched while this was rotating, you could see that the green particles are inside the cell. They're not stuck to the outside, but they're inside the cell. So these particles are small enough to enter cells. Some of them even accumulate around the nucleus. You can see them in the nucleus right here. And once they get into the nucleus, which happens within 30 minutes or a couple of hours, they start releasing chemotherapy drugs. And chemotherapy drugs, not all of them, but many of them act in the nucleus to stop DNA division. Um, and so we think these are so effective because they can enter cells in large numbers and serve as intracellular depots for release of drugs. It's like you're loading up the cell with tiny, tiny particles that have uh, molecules that change its function. So we began wondering several years ago if you could use these nanoparticles to also administer nucleic acids. And nucleic acids are a class of substances found in the human body, like DNA, messenger RNA, and protein. And this diagram is a simple form of what's called the um, central dogma of molecular biology. The DNA gets transcribed into messenger RNA and messenger RNA gets translated into proteins. And that's how information that's stored in your cell nucleus gets moved into the working molecules of cells, proteins. And what uh, biologists have learned over the last many decades is that you can, you, can, um, you can add these things to cells 
and create genetic changes in cells. And you could do that by adding plasma DNA with a particular gene. And if you get that into a cell, that gene is going to express mRNA. And that might be mRNA that the cell never would usually express, but its function will be changed because it's going to start making the protein that's encoded there. You can now deliver mRNA itself. And that would also, if you can get it into a cell, cause protein to be expressed. And you can deliver a variety of molecules that are involved in regulation of uh, translation of mRNA, like siRNA, which will silence genes, temporarily turn off a gene for some period of time. But the challenge in doing this is that these, these um, molecules have to get inside the cell. In order to work, they have to get inside the cell. And so we wondered whether we could use nanoparticles, like the ones we were using for drugs, in order to more effectively deliver these kinds of biological nucleic acids into cells. And so we started using polymers like the one I described for you, PLGA, which is a hydrophobic polymer. And we could make it work well enough to publish papers, but we knew it wasn't good. We knew it wasn't good enough. It wasn't efficient enough. Viruses are much more efficient at delivering their nucleic acids into cells, right? So uh, these weren't good enough. And then we started working with first generation cationic polymers. These are polymers that have a positive charge. So why would you use polymers with a positive charge instead of hydrophobic polymers? Because the nucleic acids have a negative charge. So if you combine a positively charged polymer with a negatively charged nucleic acid, they're going to want to bind positive to negative by electrostatics. And so they'll make particles and hold together. But those also are they're more efficient, but they're too toxic. And the toxicity seems to come from having too much positive charge. Particles that have excess positive charge are, are, are toxic to cells. So we asked the question, could you make a new generation of materials that is efficient at nucleic acid delivery, but not toxic? So could we make a polymer where we adjusted the hydrophobicity and the charge such that it would complex with nucleic acids and form nanoparticles that are stable and able to deliver the nucleic acid inside cells. And the design we came up with is shown here. Um, you'll want me to spend at least 20 minutes on the organic chemistry of this <laughs> compound. <laughs> but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to tell you there's three pieces that are covalently attached together into a long chain. So many, many of each piece. And one piece has a positive charge. That's because of this uh, tertiary nitrogen that's right here. And the other two pieces are hydrophobic. So we made, a, uh, we made a sort of hybrid molecule that had the hydrophobicity of PLGA. So it'll be a solid material that you can engineer. But it has some charge in it so that it can associate with nucleic acids. And, uh, and so you can make nanoparticles out of it. And I also won't belabor this, but over the past 10 years since we discovered this material, we showed that it could deliver plasma DNA, microRNAs, siRNA, lots of materials. And I want to talk about these last two um, uh, accomplishments that we have made in the last four years, which have really, in my mind, turned this into a material that has great value, great potential value in medicine. So some of you are wondering, why is he talking about plastic particles for delivering nucleic acids when that problem is already solved? And uh, you'll know that it's solved maybe because you know the company Alnylam, who developed particles that could uh, deliver an SN SR SIRNA molecule that treats hypercholesterolemia that occurs in the liver. Um, you might know about that, but you definitely know about two products produced by Moderna and Pfizer and BioNTech that are lipid nanoparticles that encapsulate the messenger RNA for the COVID spike protein and have been used as a vaccine. So. Um, they have in common the fact that they can deliver nucleic acids with lipid nanoparticles, not polymers, but with lipids, so a different chemistry of particle. So is the problem solved at this point? I start to answer that question by considering some of the differences between a lipid nanoparticle and a polymer nanoparticle. Here's the polymer nanoparticles we're making. Two components, RNA, messenger RNA, and the polymer. And we designed the polymer to have all the features that you need in order to assemble into a particle that's stable. Lipid nanoparticles have at least five components. They have the messenger RNA and four different lipids. And what's different about the uh, lipid nanoparticles is sort of this, the lipids that they select to put in the nanoparticle. And that already makes it a little bit more challenging as a manufacturing engineering problem to make a reproducible nanoparticle that has all these components. But they've done it remarkably. I've had five shots. 
two of Moderna, three of Pfizer at this point, and I would get more. I will get more when it's time to get more. Um, but there are some, there are some challenges. They work in a couple of, of, of limited settings because you can't get them to many organs. Systemically administered lipid nanoparticles accumulate primarily in the liver. That's why alnylam uses it to treat disease in the liver because they can't get the particles to go anywhere else. If you inject them intravenously, that's where they go. You can use them for a vaccine because you put the vaccine right where you want, into the muscle, and they work there in the muscle, but they don't go anywhere else. So how could you use them to treat a lung disease, for example? Um, and you know some of the other problems with nanoparticles. They're famously not stable, so they had to be stored under ultra-cold conditions. That makes them not available to many people in the world. There's rare toxicities of unknown origin, like uh, the myocarditis that happened in young uh, men that we still don't understand, uh, dip and the difficulty in reaching organs that I already mentioned. So these things don't prevent me from wanting to get my vaccine with lipid nanoparticles, but they suggest to me that the problem is not completely solved, and there might be opportunities uh, to take advantage of some of the benefits of polymers in nanoparticles. They can be synthesized at large scale and economically. We know in this world how to make plastics, how to make polymers, <laughs> and how to make them reproducibly and how to form them into different kinds of devices. So we ought to be able to use that understanding to help uh, in medicine. Some polymer formulations are very stable. You can lyophilize them, that is freeze dry them, and then rehydrate them when you need them. That means you could ship them anywhere easily, even at room temperature. And as you've seen, they can slowly release agents and then degrade safely. So here's the paste polymers again. And one of the features I didn't mention before, and this shows you sort of a more realistic view of what the polymer is, it's these three different components, and then you mix and match them along a chain to make a long chain polymer that then we com complex with RNA to make an, uh, a uh, nanoparticle. And in this, in this um, picture at the bottom of the screen here, you can see that we can change the composition of the paste. We can add more of the PDL component or less of the PDL component, make it more hydrophilic or more hydrophobic or less hydrophobic. And when we make it less hydrophobic, we put in more charge. So we can balance the ratio of charge and hydrophobicity that I told you before was important. At low PDL or hydrophobic concentrations, it's a liquid at room temperature. And as you move up, it becomes a waxy solid and then a real solid. So the structure, the properties of the polymer change as you change its chemistry. And so that means we could tune it for different kinds of applications. And so I want to spend the rest of the time talking about two different applications. And the first one is in collaboration with a, two physician scientists. This is Peter Glazer, who's, who's one. The other is Marie Egan. Peter is a geneticist and a, a radiation biologist, a radiation therapist. And Marie is a pediatrician who's an expert in cystic fibrosis. And uh, Peter, in his laboratory, developed a remarkable ability to synthesize molecules called peptide nucleic acids that will bind in a site-specific way to DNA inside the nucleus of a cell. Site-specific means he could pick a target in your genome, at, in a gene, and he could design a PNA to bind to it. And that, that's shown right here. Here's the PNA binding to your double-stranded DNA. And when it binds, it forms a triple helix. And you, DNA is a double helix, right? It's not supposed to form a triple helix, so your cell is smart enough to recognize this triple helix at this particular location in your chromosomes. And it will try to repair it. And almost all cells have mechanisms to repair defects in DNA. When it tries to repair the DNA, it usually uses one of the existing strands of DNA as a template, right? And does the Watson-Crick base pairing so you can get the other, uh, the other uh, duplex. But Peter also designs single-stranded donor DNAs that are almost like the native DNA, but they differ in maybe one nucleotide or two nucleotides. And that allows the repair mechanisms of the cell to, it, to make a change in the gene. Right? They'll use your template to do the repair instead of the natural template. And so if this is the cystic fibrosis gene, and you've put in a template that has, and it has a mutation, and you put in a template that doesn't have the mutation, some percentage of the time, you'll correct that gene, and all those cells will forever have uh, non-mutated uh, uh, genomic DNA. Now, the, the, it's, it's amazing. When he first introduced me to this, I said, that's not possible. <laughs> but it is. And the challenge is, how do you get these molecules, PNA and single-stranded DNA, into cells and into the nucleus, where they can do this unbelievable work? 
Well, we did it by loading them into nanoparticles. We loaded them into these PACE or polyamine coester nanoparticles I've been talking about. Um, this, is, uh, this is Peter again, and this is um, Alex Piotrowski Daspit, who had a son last week named Luke. And uh, she, uh, she made these particles with Peter's reagents, and the reagents were designed to correct a, a gene uh, defect that causes beta thalassemia. So we had mice that were engineered to have a human version of beta thalassemia. They get sick in the same way humans do. They're anemic. They don't make enough hemoglobin, so their blood is, uh, is always low in hemoglobin. And then they get all the consequences of that in uh, disease of the spleen and um, diseases of other organs. So uh, Alex took her nanoparticles and injected them, gave the mice four injections over a period of two weeks, and then waited, and then looked at their blood. And what she saw was with several different nanoparticle compositions, after 30 days or after 60 days, the animals that were anemic at the start now are not anemic anymore. If you take their bone marrow and you do genome analysis, you find that a certain percentage of their cells have been corrected. They now have the correct beta thalassemia gene and not the incorrect one. And that's just with four injections of nanoparticles. We, um, we, we know from uh, physicians that um, the earlier you treat diseases like this, the better it is for the individual who has them because damage to your organs accumulates over time. And so we thought, when's the earliest that we could treat? The earliest you could treat is before uh, an individual is born. And so these are, these are pregnant um, mice that have this defect. And David Stittleman, who's a pediatric surgeon and an expert in fetal uh, uh, surgery, injected um, these nanoparticles into, into the fetus while the fetus was in the mother. And you could see the nanoparticles. We colored them green here so you could see them as they go into the developing fetus. You can see it light up the circulation of the fetus. And then if you look at those animals when they're born, if you give them a high enough dose initially, they're born without anemia. And 10 weeks later, they still don't have anemia. And you look at their spleen and it's normal. And you look at their other organs and they're nearly normal. And so we hesitated in the paper to call it a cure, but to me this is something like a cure of, a, of an incurable uh, disease. Cystic fibrosis is, is another disease which thankfully there are treatments for certain mutations of cystic fibrosis now, but there's many, many individuals with cystic fibrosis that no treatment works. So we thought we would try this technique there, and we worked with Marie Egan, who I mentioned earlier, who's an expert in uh, cystic fibrosis. She's a physician, and so she treats kids with cystic fibrosis, but also does research on it. And these are nanoparticles. This is actually an early version of nanoparticles before we'd invented the PACE system that I like so much. Um, and uh, it's kind of a clunky nanoparticle, it has many components, but if you give it to cells, you can correct their cystic fibrosis defect. The defect in cystic fibrosis is that cells don't know how to how to deal with chloride. Uh, and you can change them so they know how to handle chloride. And if you give it to animals, not by injection, but by inhalation, we just put a drop of liquid with these nanoparticles on the nose of the mouth and, mouse and let it inhale, uh, you can see uh, that you go from, this is a normal value of nasal potential difference, a measure of chloride flux. This is how they started when they weren't treated very far off from the normal, and these are our animals that we treated, again, giving them four treatments. So we think we're on the road to another, um, to a, a better way to treat cystic fibrosis as well. The challenge is to get rid of these clunky particles and make good ones that are simple and can be engineered like the, um, like the, um, the ones I showed you before. So I had a brilliant postdoc named Yu Hang Jiang who uh, uh, did this work that is, I think, a little too technical, but I'm just going to tell you that it's really important. <laughs> <laughs> and he learned that you could take our PACE molecules, our tuned molecules, and you could just couple molecules to the end groups, and it made them much more effective at delivering messenger RNA. And the, 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 the reason for that, for those of you who, um, who uh, know a little bit about how uh, nucleic acids get inside the cells is because they, it enhances escape from endosomes. But it makes them work brilliantly well. And um, so there, we had reasons to be optimistic. We were on our way, we thought, to a new approach to treating cystic fibrosis. We'd made new polymers that were much, much more effective than any that we'd made before. They could be made into nanoparticles. And um, we were very optimistic that we could put these things together for improvements in health for cystic fibrosis. And this was early in 2020. And then this happened. Uh, 
this was the announcement to the Yale community that, uh, that we weren't coming back from spring break and uh, all classes moved online. And what it doesn't say here is that all research laboratories were closed. Uh, we had to stop doing this uh, research that we were so excited about just at a point when uh, we felt that we were about to make a breakthrough. But um, there was one exception to that, to that. Uh, if you were doing research that was related to COVID, you could work in the laboratory. You could open up your laboratory again. So we said, can you build a unique and useful COVID vaccination method for case? It's a, it, was a, it, was a, it was an easy pivot to make. And the students got tremendously excited about being part of this project. They were excited about the projects they were working on already, but they got very excited about this as we were you know, in the early days of the pandemic. You'll remember what that felt like. So this is Lexi Suberi and Molly Grun, and they figured out that you could make PACE with different uh, versions of it. And I won't tell you the, the um, details of the versions, but we, we added some polyethylene glycol to the PACE. And polyethylene glycol is a molecule that's not, if it's on the surface of nanoparticles, it makes them much more stable, makes them much more stable. And the vaccines you've gotten use this trick as well. And they tuned in the amount of uh, polyethylene glycol they put on the surface, and they found ones that were optimal. And uh, Elias Quijano and Hiwan Su, Hiwan's a chemist who made all these molecules, all these wonderful polymers. And Elias is one of the most brilliant people I've ever met. Um, he's an MD, PhD student at Yale. They injected these uh, particles into the um, muscles of mice and showed that they work just like the COVID vaccines that we now know do. If you inject them into a muscle, the mRNA gets taken up by cells and is expressed at high levels, and so ought to be a potent way to produce a vaccine. What Molly and Lexi showed beyond that was that you could deliver them the way we were delivering for cystic fibrosis, directly to the lung, in that here's two mice that were given um, just let inhale uh, these same nanoparticles. And uh, we found very robust expression of proteins. These are marker proteins just to show that it's feasible before we went to the real experiment. And that if you have to get exactly the right amount of polyethylene glycol and get the hot, to get the highest levels of protein expression. But if you look inside the lungs of the mice, even at the level of the large airways or out in the alveoli, the business end of the lung, the red here shows the messenger RNA that we delivered. And you can see it expressed throughout the epithelium of the lung of a mouse, even down in the small airways. Now, when you, um, when, when you get infected with COVID, the virus is well known now. It comes in through the air, you breathe. And the first tissue it hits is your lung. And that's why there are manifestations in the lung. There's other manifestations of COVID that you've heard about as well. There's other manifestations of flu, another respiratory pathogen that you've heard as well. But the lung is the first place that it goes, and that's how it gains entry to your body. So if, if you could develop a really strong immune response, not in your muscle, but in your lung, then you could potentially block the virus from entering and stop all the other consequences of the disease. So that's called mucosal immunology. The lung is an example of a mucosal surface, a surface that's exposed to the outside environment. You have mucosal surfaces in your eye, in your reproductive tracts, in other places in your body. But the lung is a very vulnerable one. One of the world's experts on mucosal immunology is a woman named Akiko Iwasaki. And she's in the Department of Immunobiology at, at Yale. And, and she, um, uh, she's brilliant. And she spent the last 20 years studying how do viruses infect the lung and how do you stop them? And so she developed this theory about how you could strengthen mucosal immunity by delivering, not the way we usually deliver vaccines, but by delivering it directly to the lung instead. And so we worked with her laboratory, and this is Ben and Tian, and this is Lexi and Molly and Hiwan, and they made the nanoparticles and they did the experiments because they developed a mouse that's susceptible to COVID. Most mice don't, don't get COVID. It's the only good thing I know about being a mouse. <laughs> but these do because they've been engineered so that they're susceptible to the virus. So if you give them the virus, the virus will replicate, their immune system will respond. And if, if they're not treated, they will die of the COVID infection. So we vaccinated these mice in an unusual way. We gave them our PACE mRNA nanoparticles, and we let them inhale them into their lungs, thinking that they would express the COVID 
uh, protein abundantly in the lung. You develop an immune response that's generated from the lung, and that would protect them from disease. And these are just bar graphs showing that in every measure of immunological function that Ben and Tian could make in the laboratory, uh, they saw a, a dramatic increase in that measure with animals that were treated with uh, uh, two COVID uh, intranasal vaccines. And then they did a more challenging experiment, which was to give them the vaccine. I said challenging, it wasn't meant to be a pun, but then you challenge them with the virus. You give them two doses of the vaccine and later you expose them to a controlled dose of the virus and you ask what happens over time. And what you see in these animals is the same kind of dramatic increase in immune response that I mentioned before. And for those of you that understand uh, immunology and the uh, B cells and T cells and markers, I'd be happy to talk about this. But you could do a simpler measure of how well it worked by just looking at weight loss in the animals and whether they survived the infection. And the animals that didn't get the vaccine lost weight and most of them died within uh, eight to 10 weeks. All of them died within eight to 10 weeks. The ones that got our vaccine lost weight initially but then recovered and most of them survived this uh, infection. Uh, so we think this is, uh, this is not only very promising data, but showing kind of a pathway for a unique approach for making vaccines that combine engineering of particles and understanding of immunology that could be relevant for COVID, but could be relevant for whatever respiratory pathogen we encounter in the world next. You could ask, why don't you just do this with the lipid nanoparticles, with injected? You're just, all you're doing is putting it in the nose instead of injecting it in the arm. Why don't you just take the existing vaccines and give them by the nose? And it turns out you can't do that because the lipid nanoparticles invoke high levels of inflammation in the lung. If you give them to a mouse, the mouse almost inevitably dies if it's at a concentration that would be effective at a vaccine. So we have developed approaches that are better than LNPs because they're not so highly inflammatory and uh, might be amenable to this approach. So I'm gonna stop there. I'm gonna acknowledge the people that have uh, made this work possible. And what a joy to work with these. The, the pandemic was not great, but <laughs> I was able to work with this terrific team of, of people that really kept my energy level high through a very difficult, uh, a very difficult time. And the work's been funded by the NIH, the National Heart and Blood Institute, and the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. So thanks for your attention. And I think I've left time for questions if you have any. If one of my colleagues could turn on the lights, I'll come by with the microphone. If you have a question, just raise your hand. We have a large worldwide live stream audience watching tonight. So for those of you attending virtually, you can also type in your questions in Zoom or on Facebook. Let's actually start with a, uh, a, vert a question from a virtual attendee, if I can manage all of this and get my glasses on. The question is, how, do you, how does your NP nucleic acid delivery differ from CRISPR in repairing disease-causing genes? Yeah, that's a, that's a great uh, question. So if, if you've uh, read or heard anything about gene editing before what I talked about tonight, you probably heard it in the context of, a, of a, an approach that's called CRISPR. Um, and it's, uh, it's a really brilliant finding that was discovered from uh, the immune system of ancient organisms like bacteria uh, that the bacteria use to fight foreign RNA that enters their body. Uh, but scientists have learned how to take this finding from basic biology and turn it into a method of gene editing. The problem with CRISPR is, and, and they're getting better all the time, but one of the problems with CRISPR is it's an enzyme that goes into the cell and it cuts, it, makes a, a, a double strand break in your DNA and then the DNA gets repaired in the same way I talked about here. But because it's an enzyme, it's, you, you can turn on the activity, but it's hard to turn off. So directing it to the site that you want without causing promiscuous strand breaks in other places has been one of the challenges with CRISPR. People are making tremendous progress with it. Our sy system is much simpler. It doesn't involve an enzyme, it just involves this binding of the PNA to the DNA to create the triple helix. 
So it ought to be more specific and more controllable. And I think that's the biggest advantage. The other advantage is that, that we learned how to load these molecules into nanoparticles, and we were one of the first groups to show that you could do gene editing in an intact animal, not having to take the cells out of the animal and do the gene editing and then put them back in, which you could do with the bone marrow, for example, but that you could just let them be inhaled in the lung and you could edit the tissue in situ. So I think those are the two major advantages. There are some other details. Um, I have a grandson with cystic fibrosis, and I'm curious as to whether you're going back to we, keep we, working on CF and um, do the children you work with have to be in utero or can they be 22? Yeah. Um, so we haven't done any, we're, we're still studying in animals, in, in animal models of disease. We haven't done anything in human uh, patients yet, in children. Um, but the approach could be used at any age. The approach could be used at any age. Um, the advantage of doing it earlier is that the, you know, the, the, the physical effects that, that continue with time won't reverse even if you do the gene editing later. So earlier treatment is, is better. But we think this would be useful in, um, in um, making an in utero treatment like this is going to take a long time because it's got to be absolutely safe. It's going to take years and years to work that out. The first application of this will certainly be in uh, older patients. Um, and, and, and the answer to your question is, yes, we've got, we've, we're doing both things now. Uh, we're, we're, we had the, there was one period during the pandemic when we could only work on COVID-related projects, so we really intensely studied that then. But now we're back to full time in the laboratory and we're working on both things simultaneously. All right, Dr. Saltzman, back here on your left, oh. towards the back of the room. Thank you. I was curious, uh, you kind of talked a little bit about kind of how access and equity kind of framed your problem that you were trying to solve in terms of the COVID vaccine. How does equity play into your framing of problems for other research that you do to the technology that you would be um, developing? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, I have a long interest in developing um, contraceptives as well, or new forms, ways of giving contraceptives. And so we're working on a, a project now. Uh, it's a fully degradable contraceptive implant. Uh, that work is funded by the uh, US Agency for International Development. And the, and the target there is mainly to make it inexpensive, transportable, reliable, and you, you only need to see a, a healthcare provider once. Uh, because you, you, you'd get the implant and then the implant would completely disappear. And if you didn't want to continue um, uh, with contraception, that would be it. So, um, so that's, it, I think that's just the, the challenge for the future is how to take these, these kinds of things and, how to, and make them um, accessible to as many people as possible. That just seems like what engineers want to do and ought to do. I think with the, with the gene editing, it's a little more complicated because most of the diseases are rare diseases. And uh, th I think they're, they're certainly going to be uh, developed in developing nations first. Uh, but there's no reason why the technology itself couldn't be affordable enough to transport around the world. They might involve, in some cases, they could involve, you know, you, know, you need a really highly skilled healthcare delivery system. I mean, if you're going to do intravenous injections in a uh, developing fetus, you, that requires a high level of skill. So I, I think that's a great question, and there's no simple answer to it. I just want to say thank you for asking, and it's high on my mind. I would like to end my career by saying I did some things that were valuable to all people. All right, Dr. Salzman, way back here in the back of the room, please. Hi, I was wondering if the PACE polymers in gene editing, do they just edit somatic cells or do they go further to um, gametes and potentially prevent um, your children from gaining genetic diseases? Yeah, so that's a great question. And so one of the groups that I've been involved with that I didn't mention is the Somatic Cell Gene Editing Consortium, uh, which my lab is a part of, and it labs across the country. It's funded by the National Institutes of Health. Now, the, the way that the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, thinks about it, and I think the way that, that most regulatory bodies or the CDC would think about it, is that you don't want to be editing um, gametes, non-somatic cells. 
because then you're, you're, you're not only treating one individual, you're treating all the progeny of that individual, right? And the, and the ethical implications of that are, um, are not clear. So I think we need to think about germline editing. I think that's going to take a lot more thought and it's going to be a lot more focused and there's going to have to be a, a bigger bar for saying this is, this is something that's appropriate to do. So we're now, now focused just on somatic cell. But the other side of that is that when we do this gene editing, we have to confirm that we didn't affect the germline cells. And uh, that's an important part of showing that, uh, th that it's a viable technology. It's a great question. All right, we'll stay here in the back of the room for another question. Yes, my question is, as someone who really understands the, the mechanics, the you know, biochemistry of how COVID vaccines work, can you offer any reassurances or maybe a perspective for convincing some patients who are concerned about the safety of that mechanism, given that you seem to support the vaccine? Yeah. Yeah, it's a tough, it's a tough question. It's a, t it's a tough question. I mean, the, the decision for me uh, was easy because you know, we'd been studying mRNA delivery in, um, in a variety of different contexts for many years. And so uh, I felt comfortable with that as, a, as an approach to, uh, to vaccinate. In fact, we did some early studies on delivering plasma DNA to create vaccines, and those, those work as well. So the idea of using genetics to, um, to make a vaccine doesn't make me uncomfortable. Uh, I, I've, I've had five uh, <laughs> shots at this point. I'll get another whenever I'm eligible. Uh, because it's allowed me to continue my work in the way that I want to uh, want to do, and I think the data is clear that um, that people that are vaccinated are much less likely to certainly much less likely to die from the disease or get worse uh, infections from the disease, and much less likely to get even mild infections, the flu-like infections that are not life-threatening but still troublesome. Um, so I. I don't know if I'm the right person to convince people that are vaccine hesitant that they shouldn't uh, be, um, but I, am, I have no hesitancy a a at all. And I have no hesitancy in, in, uh, in uh, getting vaccines for my young children also. And um, I feel, I, I have looked at the data very closely and I feel comfortable that it's safe. All right, we'll stay back here. One more question. <laughs> With your work with uh, cystic fibrosis, do you have any positive uh, prognostications or therapeutic um, goings with pulmonary fibrosis? Not with pulmonary. I think that's really, pulmonary fibrosis is a, a really an overlooked uh, problem that is, that is not rare. Lots of people suffer from different forms of pulmonary fibrosis and there's very few treatments for them. So um, there's, some, there's some excellent folks at Yale who are working on pulmonary fibrosis, and that's a direction I'd like to go in the future, but not one that we've studied yet. All right, we'll move up front here. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I was wanting to go back to the plastic question. You know, there's all these cosmetics and you know, cleansers and stuff that have these particles in them, obviously much larger than these nanoparticles, but what's the half-life of that plastic or what, you know, what's the ultimate destination of that plastic? Yeah, that's a really great uh, question. And there's, um, in cosmetics, but there's also some recent evidence that, it, that if you look, you know, the, the, um, there, there's, there's non-degraded plastics everywhere, small particles of non-degraded plastics, including probably in all of us, from uh, exposure to the environment, from drinking out of plastic water bottles, from, uh, there's no evidence linking it to any diseases yet, but it can't be a good thing, right, that we have this. So I think there's the, there's the kind of environment plastics issue that you're bringing up and trying to, trying to, um, trying to find alternate materials that are safer and that can be used, that are recyclable, that are amenable to those kinds of things. I think that's a, that's, that's a really important problem for the future. I think the uh, cosmetics is, uh, you know, th this, this, I mean, the, the only part of this that I really think I know well enough to answer your question is that this polymer polyethylene glycol that we use to stabilize the particles, that's used to stabilize the, the Pfizer particles and the Moderna particles, is widespread in use. 
Um, it's, a, it's not a degradable polymer in the body like the ones that I've uh, shown you. And there's some evidence that people develop immune responses to it. And you're shifting the balance in your immune system. And it's in my favorite beverage, Dr. Pepper, is loaded with polyethylene. <laughs> Uh, but it, but you, you, you can't, you'd have to be very careful about eating, not to eat foods that have quite a lot of polyethylene glycol in it, because it's, it's used and considered to be safe. I think we need to explore those things more, understand more about um, what's in foods, what's in cosmetics. The cosmetics are not regulated like drugs are, um, and I, I think they're not really pro-regulation, but I do think we ought to understand better the consequences of using those kinds of materials. All right, Dr. Saltzman, let's take a question from a virtual attendee. And the question is, can you design PACE polymer nanoparticles that can be injected into circulation and be organ specific in their uptake? We can to some extent. So we figured out how to avoid the major uptake in the liver. And I don't have the data here to show you, but, but, um, but stabilizing them with polyethylene glycol is a big part of it. Uh, but other uh, approaches work as well. Um, and we've found just kind of by screening different compositions that there are some particles that, uh, that, are, uh, that go to some organs more than others. So I know a composition that will send a lot of particles to the spleen. And I know compositions that will send a lot of particles to the lung. And so we're starting to get a handle on that. And I think that's really important for trying to design the next generation of these therapies. All right, question over here to your left. This is a, a kind of a personal question in terms of kind of what inspired you to get into this type of work, but it, it sounds like being from Iowa, you might have grown up on a farm or been around farming a lot, and genetic engineering has been such an important part of crops and cattle and other uh, farm animals for so long. Uh, did that influence you at all in terms of that? And is there any crossover kind of research and understanding of uh, those two types of areas of study, what you're doing and kind of what they're doing in farming currently? Yeah. Um, so I don't know if that was a huge influence. It probably was a, a subtle uh, influence because I was around a lot, of, uh, a lot of farm families. All my grandparents were farmers. And so I have cousins that are still farming uh, today. But, um, but um, yeah, a bigger influence for me, which will totally not answer your question at all, was that um, my, my grandfather, Woody, who I showed you before, was, um, went to college. He was um, uh, one of seven uh, children, the only, uh, the only son. And, um, and all his sisters went to college as well, a farm family that, that in the, their time that sent all their children to college. It was a testimony to the affordableness of uh, education in Iowa, <laughs> higher education in Iowa. But um, he, he went to, to the University of Iowa and studied civil engineering and didn't finish his degree uh, because he was going during the, during the Depression. And his father got sick, and so he went back home to the farm and took over running the family farm. And I think he never expressed any frustration about that. But he was, but he was, if you have a picture in your mind of an engineer, that's what he was like. And he, he had his desk that was totally, you know, immaculate with the checkbook and the pen and the typewriter and everything in exactly the position that he wanted it in. So if you wanted to get yelled at by Woody, you would go fool around with his desk. But, um, so I, I think I, I, I picked up that uh, from him. He's the, the only, Person I know in my, I'm the only person that pursued science as a career. So, um, thanks for the question. We have a couple of virtual uh, questions or questions from virtual attendees. Uh, number one is why do LMPs cause so much inflammation? Yeah, good, good question. It's not completely known. I, I said something about the, the there, are, there are several different lipid components. Lipid metabolism is very complex. What happens to lipids in, a, in, a, in an environment like in the muscle, like in the lymph nodes where they transfer to after you've delivered the muscle? I think there's a lot of unknowns there. And you're delivering sort of a cocktail of five different lipids. Um, I think they're be, causing inflammation is is, is um, 
part of their success in making a vaccine that gives a very robust immune response. Remember when the first data came out on the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, the efficiency of these vaccines was sort of out of the ballpark compared to conventional vaccines. And it could be that your immune system, in order to ramp up a response, needs some inflammation. It needs to get the cells that are involved in the immune response to the local site. So that might be good for that application, but it's not good for tissues like the lung. All right, and the next question. Would your intranasal delivery method for COVID-19, for example, be more or less economical than the existing IM vaccines? The existing IN vaccines? IM. IM vaccines. I, um, I think it would be because of the stability. I think a large part of the cost is the complexity of manufacturing with lipid nanoparticles. This will be not quite as complex. I think the, the raw materials will be cheaper. Polymers are cheaper than lipids in general. Um, and, uh, but if we can really make them stable at room temperature, or we can make them freeze dried so you could transport them easily in a sealed uh, container, then that will change access and affordability tremendously. All right, thank you online attendees for the questions. And the back of the room's coming on strong uh, with the question. Let's do, uh, let's do a couple more real quick ones here. We're a little past the top of the hour, but I think we can get these in. So obviously the oligonucleotide market has been exploding with uh, the vaccine research and everything. Have the polymer uh, nanoparticles taken over any market share or is it all lipid nanoparticles right now? It's all, in terms of commercially available, it's all lipid uh, nanoparticles at this point. There are some polymer nanoparticles that are used and have been used uh, for a long time for drug delivery. Um, there are some long acting uh, hormone treatments that are used to treat uh, prostate cancer and some other, um, some other uh, indications um, that have been around for a while. So, so these polymers were sort of in there first, but with the oligonucleotides, uh, it's, it's really been the LMPs that have the, had the first uh, clinical success. I think that's going to be followed up by success from polymer materials as well. And maybe we'll find that, you know, that the LMPs are good for some applications, polymers are better for others. I think there's a whole world of opportunities and it doesn't have to be that, that one wins. Um, I had a disclosure on the first uh, slide here that I sort of passed over, but uh, a company called Xanadu Bio has just li licensed this uh, technology from Yale and, are, uh, and um, raised a significant amount of money to start pursuing. Uh, this is an alternate to LNPs, so I'm, I'm hopeful that we can make an impact. I just had a quick question. Um, does the scalability and the affordability and the freeze dryability make it so easy that it can be done affordably anywhere, but also does it make it maybe less controllable that anyone could use it for whatever purpose they want? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great uh, question. And in fact, you know, some of the best manufacturing of, uh, of materials like this is in China and India. Indian in particular is sort of uh, without much um, uh, publicity, but really uh, th there's a, an organization called PopVax there that is developing uh, GMP level facilities for manufacturing LNPs that will have the same level of quality as the ones that are made that are made here. Um, I, I, I think it's a it's, it's a it's a it's a technology that's going to rapidly spread around the uh, around the world. And so the other concerns that were sort of expressed in the last part of your uh, sentence, I think, are are, are good ones. Um, it's a, it is a powerful tool, and um, I think that's why people are suspicious of it. It is, it is a powerful tool, um, uh, so we, we need to be very careful about how it's, how it's deployed. We have very good systems for regulation here in the U.S., and I know much less about how it happens in other places. Right. Professor Salzman, thank you so much for a wonderful lecture. And thank you everyone for attending tonight's program. Visit lindahall.org for information about all of our upcoming events and all of our library resources. Thank you and have a great rest of your evening.